The Department of Homeland Security is launching a new policing program that is being accused of being tantamount to pre-crime policing. Now, they say they're going to go after terrorists and extremists, most notably far right and white supremacist terrorists, which poses the biggest threat. Now, I think that is incorrect, but I will say this. White supremacy is bad. It, it, it's, it's really, really bad. Like, I, I don't like people who have those opinions. They're allowed to have those opinions. I think those opinions are very bad. That being said, having those opinions is protected by the First Amendment. You stay away from me. I stay away from you. So long as people don't get violent, we'll learn to figure out how we navigate this stuff. Now, violent white supremacy is extremely bad as well. I don't even think I need to say it, but I guess 99.9% of people agree, except for, I suppose, violent white supremacists. So it's not immediately bad when the government comes out and says, yo, this is a bad thing. We want to stop. That being said, you must be careful when the government targets something reprehensible that everyone thinks is bad as an excuse to expand powers into what is being called pre-crime policing. Not to mention, I think most of us recognize the violence from Black Lives Matter and Antifa is also extremely bad and hurting people and costing billions of damage, dollars in damages. So we want to stop that too. Please, why won't you call that out? Because they're going, they're, they're, they're trying to rally support from the establishment and the mainstream, and they don't care about you. But I will add, before we read the story, something to consider. You know, a lot of people have said, which nightmarish dystopia do we live in? 1984? Fahrenheit 451? A brave new world? Viva Vendetta? Well, I've called it a brave new Fahrenheit 1984 for Vendetta. Did I get it? Something like that. The only thing is, I just now realized with this new program, it's more like a brave new Fahrenheit 1984 for Vendetta report. Because the pre-crime stuff is from the dystopian movie Minority Report, where psychics would say you'd commit a crime, they'd stop you before you committed it. And the evidence that you committed a crime was the vision of a psychic. Now, I get it in the se- in I think it's Philip K. Dick. I, I could be wrong. But in, in the movie, in the story, They have like a video recording of the psychic's vision, but still you didn't actually do anything and they would arrest you and then put you in prison for something you did not do. If they can stop you from doing it, then why should they imprison you? That's the interesting thing about the pre-crime policing. But I will say this. It's more than just this story, as per usual. I want to show you this on the Post Millennial. Olympia man arrested after being caught on camera shooting at Proud Boy member in Olympia, Washington. Real Clear Investigations has a story out today. Little outcry over Antifa's equal opportunity beatdowns of journalists left and right by, by Mark Hemingway. Very interesting. Why is it that the DHS is so willing to come out demonizing the right when we actually have way more media coverage of the left beating innocent people? It's because the DHS is on the side of Antifa. Now, hold on there a minute. I'm not saying that anyone from the DHS is meeting with Antifa, patting them on the back and saying, do good jobs. I'm saying that they're basically, it's like a truce almost, not formal, but the DHS is mostly like, "Eh, we're going to ignore them. You even look at the comments from Mark Milley during the peak of these riots where they were firebombing a federal building and he goes, it's just smoke and chalk. It's no big deal. And there it is. Mark Milley. Trump was like, we got to stop these riots. And he's like, no, that's your government letting them do it. So keep this in mind. When it comes to their pre-crime policing, do you think they will be fair in how they handle this? The answer is an obvious no. New DHS program aimed at domestic violent extremism, accused of being tantamount to pre-crime. From TimGuest.com, the creation of the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships has rights groups, particularly conservative and right-leaning ones, right-leaning ones, concerned that CP3 could be unfairly targeting them. Quote, today, U.S.-based lone actors and small groups, including homegrown violent extremists and domestic violent extremists, who are inspired by a broad range of ideological motivations, pose the most significant and persistent terrorism-related threat to our country, Alejandro Mayorkas said during a Senate Homeland Security hearing on counterterrorism. America said CP3 will be targeting, among other things, perceived governmental overreach and conspiracy theories promoting violence, although we did not clarify what he or his department believes constitutes these things. Activist Ed Hasbrook 
Hasbro, a consultant for the nonprofit Identity Project, compared the efforts to root out domestic terrorism to pre-crime policing. CP3's attempts to predict future crimes are to be based on behavioral patterns, i.e. profiling, and on encouraging members of the public to inform on their families, friends, and classmates. The problem is that the law does not permit prosecution based solely on patterns of lawful behavior. With good reason, pre-crime prediction is a figment of the imagination of the creators of the dystopian fantasy movie Minority Report. Wasn't Minority Report Philip K. Dick? Am I wrong about that one? I'll look into it. This is what you need to understand. From real clear investigations, we know it. We really do know it. There is a disproportionate amount of coverage, time, and attention paid to uh, violence in this country. If Antifa goes around beating old people, and they do, and I've personally watched them do it, you'd think there'd be a news story about it, but there isn't. I mean, there's a news story from Fo- a news story from Fox, or when I come out with video footage out of San Jose. Other than that, nope. When it came to Andy No being beaten. This was kind of like a major moment. The media freaked out. They could not ignore the story. It was a brutal video of an unprovoked attack on a journalist. Even Brian Stelter blurbed it out for 10 seconds. Sure, he could have, he could have done a long segment talking about, you know, violence, but he's on the side of Antifa. What did, what did Chris Cuomo say? So since when were protests supposed to be peaceful? Yeah, now that guy's being accused of assaulting a woman, so I'm not going to take his word for it. Although, when it comes to uh, our, an incorrect opinion about the First Amendment, we can just throw it to that dude eating ramen who was like, it's just in the First Amendment. All you got to do is look it up, Mr. Cuomo. That's right. Let's check this out. So we know what the government's intention is. From Real Clear Investigations, they say from covering displaced refugees around the globe to the obstacles faced by protesters seeking change in America. Freelance photojournalist Marini Staub believes her camera can be a force for truth and social justice. The work of a conflict photographer often requires physical courage in places she has reported from, such as Africa and the Middle East. It certainly did so on August 22nd, while Staub was covering demonstrations in Portland, Oregon. Members of the left wing group Antifa called her, they called her a slut, and then demanded that journalists assembled to cover the protests get the F out. Staub, a 2020 reporting fellow for the Liberal Pulitzer Center, tried to calm the situation. She was assaulted. She told the Willamette Week that they grabbed her phone and smashed it. Then they threw her to the pavement and sprayed her with mace. The ugly assault on Staub below was filmed and distributed quickly online, resulting in widespread condemnation. If we're on a public street and a newsworthy event is occurring, you're not going to tell me what I can and cannot film, Staub told the weekly newspaper. It's fascinating. That's uh, literally what I and many other people and journalists have been saying for some time. Once again, just being repeated by another journalist. But here's the interesting thing. To many people, Marini Staub is viewed as sympathetic to the left, anti-police. You know, I got to say, there's a lot of people who don't understand news, right? I'll go down and I'll interview some Antifa guy at a protest and then they'll be like, why are you supporting them? And I'll be like, dude, I just literally asked what they thought. I'll go down and I'll talk to the police. And the left says, like, why are you talking to the police? Because I want to know what's going on. They want you to be on their side no matter what. And you see, what we get here is someone like Marini, probably pronouncing Marini, however you pronounce her name, is a journalist, probably left sympathies, but still wanting to just film what's going on, not refusing to back down. This is what happens. They will beat you. They will destroy your equipment. For the small band of reporters willing to cover the violent left-wing radicals in Antifa, such attacks are distressingly common. Protest mayhem has been in the news since the murder of George Floyd last summer brought many Black Lives Matter. And we, we get it. Quote, we are deeply concerned by the increase in attacks on journalists working in the U.S. The Committee to Protect Journalists tells Real Clear Investigations. Since 2017, the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker has documented 517 journalists attacked during protests, 400 of those in 2020 alone. Despite the alarming increase in such attacks, reporters who cover Antifa express frustration that the condemnation of the attack on Staub was an aberration. More often than not, Antifa's attack, attacks on the press have gone ignored, with the police typically standing back in the current climate of hostility toward law enforcement. The journalists who have done significant reporting on the loose-knit group are of divergent backgrounds and motivations, but tend to have one thing in common. They represent a new breed of journalists without the backing of traditional corporate media outlets. Instead, they rely on social media to break news. Some of their work has been criticized by other journalists who claim they blur the line between professional reporting and activism. And I will say of many of these people, they are too cowardly to call out Antifa. 
and I have seen it. And I know these people personally. And some of these people claim to be on the side of freedom. And I say, if you watched Antifa punch someone in the face, why won't you report this? Well, I don't know the guy was Antifa. I mean, shut up. Don't know if they were. They're all there together. They're all protesting together. None of the, no one there stops it from happening. But mm, I don't know. If it happens, it happens. No reporter is better known for covering Antifa than Andy No, author of the best-selling book Unmasked, Inside Antifa's Radical Plan to Destroy Democracy. No, the son of Vietnamese immigrants, first started reporting on protest violence for Portland State Vanguard, Portland State University student newspaper, in 2016. He was fired from his job at the paper the next, uh, the next year after he was accused of sensationalizing a clip of a Muslim student at a university, uh, saying that being an infidel is not allowed in Muslim countries. This ended No's traditional journalism career, but the story blew up online and was picked up by conservative media nationally. With left-wing violence largely ignored by legacy news organizations, No quickly found there was a market for coverage of Portland's growing problem with street violence, notably by Antifa. I think a better way to phrase it is, if something is not being done and it needs to be done and you decide to do it, I wouldn't call that an open market, right? If I see that the garbage hasn't been taken out and then I decide to take the garbage out, no one's going to say that Tim Pool realized there was a market for taking out the garbage because no one else will and decided to no, I decided to take out the garbage. Andy Noe is a journalist. He's covering news. He sees that not, the stories aren't, there are not being covered. People are craving information. What's happening? I wouldn't say that he noticed a hole in the market. That's to imply it's simply a business decision or to imply that he's a grifter. I think Andy Noe was like, hey, no one's covering this. We need to talk about what's going on. It's bad. Now, you can say that if he was against it, which he is, it's activisty. No problemo. I got no problem with that. So long as he's covering it, showing us the information and telling us what's happening. With that being said, I've criticized Andy in the past. When he went to a protest in, in Portland, I believe, undercover, and it was not a, a major newsworthy event. It was a small local protest. There was no, nothing major happening. He says he was trying to get more information on his book, and I said it was reckless. And if you're the only one or the, mo or the most prominent individual covering the violence from the extreme left, why risk yourself over something so trivial? Now, I get it. They're going out. They're causing violence. But it's, it's time to hire somebody. It's time to expand the operation. Of course, many people freaked out and were like, screw you, Tim, you're, you don't even go on the ground and yelling at me. And I'm like, I don't care. I went on the ground for years. I traveled all over the country and simply criticizing Andy No one time does not mean I don't like the guy or don't appreciate what he's doing. People are just that tribal. They're like, don't criticize Andy. Shut up. If Andy does something worth, worthy of criticism, I'll criticize it. I don't care who, who does what. I, I praised Rashida Tlaib earlier because she stood on principle, principles I disagreed with. Because you know what? I care about consistency. I'm not going to blindly follow behind someone who does dumb things. If Andy does something wrong, I'll say it. I love it. The left was like, Tim Pool is the voice of reason on Andy. Bro, maybe y'all should realize my issues here are not about your tribe or being on your side. I believe in freedom. I believe in honesty and integrity. And we can't all be perfect, myself included. I get things wrong. There's certain private information and details I can't share because maybe I have people that, you know, sources I got to protect. So it makes you know, for, for conflicts. They, they occur. It, it happens to everybody. But I got no problem criticizing anybody or praising anybody if I think they do something good. And in fact, I try not to play into these games. I'll try and praise someone on the left if they do something I think is worthy of, of, of compliment. That being said, Andy does a great job covering what's going on on the ground. And it's funny that I can criticize the guy one time and everyone loses their minds. Look in the mirror if you can't handle this criticism. But I will point out, for the most part, I think the people who choose to watch my show and the reason why Timcast isn't the number one podcast for whatever, you know, in, in politics or news, well, it's because I don't. I think a lot of the bigger podcasts are more than willing to either ignore an issue or just blindly side with a faction for the sake of winning for their tribe. And that's because they're a part of that group. Me? Not so much. I believe in freedom. I'll agree with you on freedom. And uh, uh, that's about it, right? If, we, if you do something right, I'll praise it. That being said, I think most of you who watch this probably agree with what I'm saying. And there's a lot of people on the right who don't care and say, the le you know, one thing I heard a lot was, the left will lie, cheat, and steal. They never criticize their own, blah, blah, blah. And so you have to stand by the right no matter what. And, uh, the left burns themselves down all the time. They call it a circular firing squad. This needs to be addressed. Now, rant over. Here's the point. When Andy No is brutalized and they, and they write these things about how they want to kill him, 187, police code for denoting murder, the media insults him. Now, at first, when Andy was attacked, 
We saw the media come out and say, OK, OK, you know, this was bad. You know, it shouldn't have happened. And then the propaganda came. And, you know, is secretly part of the far right and working with the far right. All lies. Now they can justify ignoring the violence and the calls to, to his murder. I'm not going to cover it. I find it fascinating that uh, when it comes to uh, Marini or however you pronounce her name, she, there was a statement from the Committee to Protect Journalists. They did not do the same thing for Andy No. Now, what's the point of all of this? Aside from the more emotional rant about people needing to accept criticism, if you can't accept criticism, you can't improve. Aside from that, I think what we're seeing is the obvious. If they're going to be enacting some kind of pre-crime program, do you think they'll be doing it to go after Antifa? No. I understand a guy in, in Antifa wildly was shooting in the street and shot somebody and he got arrested. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a line still. But here's the thing. Antifa can smash up windows, burn down buildings, and the media don't care. And so long as the media don't care, the government's not going to do anything about it. You see, politicians, many Republicans, I think most Republicans, are more concerned about the opinion of the New York Times as opposed to the opinion of their constituents. And that means if the media is unwilling to address an issue, they don't care to focus on it. So if every single Trump supporter in this country said Antifa bad and we want law enforcement to stop them, but the media doesn't say anything, then the Republicans don't say anything either, at least for the most part, except for those that have principles or, you know, are trying to keep their ear to the ground. No, what happens is they say, what are my constituents thinking about? Well, whatever the media tells them to think about. And the media is dominated by the cultural left and the institutional Democrats, in which case, what do you think Republicans are going to chase after? Now, it does get interesting as independent news outlets start to become more and more prominent. But here's where I think we're going. It starts with banning, removing voices. Now we're at the point where Joe Biden gave a speech today, and we'll, we'll cover this in the, in the, in, in, uh, the 4 p.m. segment. For those on the podcast, you probably already heard it. Joe Biden's like, we got, we got you know, 25% of this country. They won't do the right thing. The unv- is a p- pandemic of the unvexed. And here we go. Here's the rhetoric. They're going to blame you. Isn't that what they do? I think the Democratic establishment realizes that deviants and critical thinkers are a threat to the machine. And so, of course, they're finding a way to separate them. But the Internet has changed things. And there's no there's no done deal. I think it's entirely possible that with the Internet, they might try to censor. They might try to control things. But the Fediverse, crypto technology, it's really making it damn near impossible to do. They tried getting rid of Alex Jones. You know, let me tell you something. Alex Jones launches band.video and some other websites. Now, he's still getting hundreds of thousands of views on his content. His show's still getting millions. He's still everywhere. I did an interview with Alex Jones. He came here. He interviewed me out by the trees. It got half a million views in less than a day. Alex Jones' own website has that much power and pull. We don't need all of this stuff like YouTube. That's why we have TimCast.com. Critical infrastructure being built to support free and independent Americans, those who believe in individualism and believe in the American system of government. They can't take it away. They'll try to. And that's why I think we see these these programs like the DHS. They need to find a way to go after thought. It's hard. We have a First Amendment and a Second Amendment. And the United States is not one small country. It is a massive country of many different states, each of their own laws. And some states are more willing to protect than others. And many states are red, some are blue. The government doesn't have the ability to just come in and sweep everyone out and just shut it all down. This is the hope. This is the light at the end of the tunnel, the the door closing with the window opening. A lot of people say, Tim, why are you still on YouTube? You should quit YouTube. Because I think my channel being on YouTube, despite the censorship, is that open window. That when they close a door with censorship, there's still an open window. What does that mean? Well, look, I don't have the same opinions as Alex Jones. I think he's a bit off the rails sometimes, although he gets a lot right and he should deserve his credit for when he does. He also says a lot of really crazy things I can't corroborate and I think are just probably wrong. Just because I, can, just because I can prove some of the stuff I think is crazy true doesn't mean it's all true. But Jones gets stuff right. He, re- he really does. It's really fascinating. Um, and the left hates it. But uh, example, he said George Washington wrote a letter to someone about the Illuminati denouncing it. And I was like, no, he didn't. I Googled it to the Library of Congress. That's the kind of stuff he gets right. The left won't accept that. They say, Tim Pool's defending Infowars, saying they're, they're right. Mm-hmm. There's a clip of me from a long time ago where I said that they were like a right-wing Huffington Post. 
Now, the full context was during the 2016 election, Alex Jones was trying to make Infowars more mainstream in the stories they were covering, less so lizard people type stuff. You know, I'm, I'm being facetious, but less weird Illuminati conspiracy and more we're on the ground at a Trump rally. They don't want you to hear that context because they want you to outright just believe Alex is always crazy. But anyway, the main issue is I could shut all this down and say, oh, you know what? Fine. We won't be a part of their system. We won't be on YouTube. But I had Alex Jones on my show and Steve Bannon and many other people who are not allowed to be on YouTube in this capacity. It creates a pathway for conversations that they're trying to shut down. Once we lose that and the, the, the establishment excises the free and independent individual and thinker, you'll start seeing crackdowns. You'll see DHS, police, arrests. And then what? The media will just lie about you and no one will defend you. And the jury will say, I'm not sticking my neck out for you. Let's see what happens with Kyle Rittenhouse. That's where this goes. And I'll leave it there. Next segment's coming up at 4 p.m. over at youtube.com slash Timcast. Thanks for hanging out, and I'll see you all then.